Hello, one and all. Welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Glad to be back here with you again today, courtesy of the William Wood Foundation. Uh, we have a wonderful um, article in the current issue that we're going to talk about today. And it really ties in with the geopolitical situation we find ourselves in here at the end of 2022. A century before Vladimir Putin's Russia invaded Ukraine, Commander Robert Gormley steered his destroyer across the Black Sea to the Civil War ravaged Ukrainian port of Odessa. And therein hangs a sea story that involves warring Greeks and Turks, recalcitrant Bol Bolsheviks, and a war starved population, and a young naval officer who will later rise to more prominence in the Pacific War has his first early challenge. And so here to talk about Commander Gormley's Black Sea Challenge with us are co-authors Elliot Carlson and Robert J. Hanyak. Welcome, gentlemen. Glad to have you here. Glad to be with you. Thank you. Sad to be here. Elliot, it's great to have you back in the magazine again. Uh, uh, folks who remember, of course, Elliot is the author of the great Joe Rochefort's War, which is a groundbreaking work on intelligence efforts in World War II Pacific. Uh, and this is a fascinating story that um, ties in with uh, the current situation and what the Navy was doing 100 years ago in the exact same war-torn area that is a war-torn area today, the Black Sea region. So how did you stumble across this interesting story, Elliot? Well, I'm in the process, at least in theory, of writing a biography of, of Robert Gormley. And uh, in going through Gormley's papers, I came across the a name of, of uh, Robert Bristol, the uh, commander of American forces in the Black Sea. So I went over to the Library of Congress and went through the Bristol papers and came across as a gold mine of material on Gormley. And I read about 100 pages of, of Gormley, of uh, Bristol's war diary, which lays out what Gormley did in the Black Sea in 21, 20, 22. And uh, he had quite an adventure of ups and downs. He was in and out of favor with Bristol, but finally ended up in favor after how he acquitted himself uh, at Odessa and at Stimson. That's really, uh, yeah, it's an adventure packed uh, story. He really has to sail between the Scylla and Charybdis of any number of situations. Well, um, Elliot, your uh, co-author on this one is Robert Hanyak, and we're glad to have you in the magazine as well, Robert. Robert is a former okay. historian with the National Security Agency. So how did you get involved in this collaborative effort? Well, I was asked by Elliot to join him on doing the uh, biography of Robert Gormley. And at that stage, I think we had our research had sort of stalled because of the pandemic and everything. And we were looking over uh, some of the material that already had been written up in draft form. And I, and I mentioned to Elliot, I said, you know, Black Sea's a hot spot right now. Maybe this will have some relevance uh, with Gormley uh, getting involved with the Bolsheviks in Odessa and later on uh, trying to uh, hold off the uh, Greeks and Turks there on the northern, on the northern shore of, of Turkey. Uh, and it proved to be a story of, of some relevance because, uh, of course, the Black Sea now is a, is a hot spot. And so that we, we basically took that chapter out and uh, rewrote it to uh, accommodate a standalone article. Yeah, it's great stuff. Um, so why don't we start from the beginning, Elliot, and tell us about what uh, Gormley finds himself embroiled in once he gets over there. Uh, there's a number of things, but it's one thing after another. So let's start from the beginning. Gormley arrives in uh, late 2021 and uh, is, is, is immediately assigned to uh, do escort duty of uh, ships that are taking relief to uh, starving populations on both sides of the uh, Black Sea. Uh, Ataturk's forces are, are uh, seizing Asia Minor and there are American uh, relief workers scattered in, in uh, camps along the southern border of the Black Sea. So uh, Gormley's job is to escort relief boats in there and uh, make sure that uh, the food gets to the people. And he was doing the same thing on the north part of the Black Sea, 
uh, uh, escorting ships to Odessa and Novorossak. So uh, that kept Gormley busy for 18 or 18 months or so, not to mention work in the Eastern Mediterranean. So he was all over and he uh, had, had an unusual break in that his wife insisted on following him to, to uh, Constantinople. So he was, uh, his wife felt so sorry for him. He was, he was missing her so badly that she showed up in Constantinople and she kept him company there for about a year. Well, that certainly takes the sting out of being deployed. Um, uh, Robert, um, there's an irony to this mission for uh, young Gormley, is there not? I mean, he's pr providing relief for a conflict-torn region, and the Bolsheviks, whereas they have to be grateful that their starving populace is getting fed, at the same time, there's some disgruntledness in their part because it kind of makes their system look bad that the Americans have to come in and bring the supplies and the food. So he actually gets some sort of negative pushback, even though he's doing good works. Isn't that, isn't that how it sort of unfolded? Yes, it was. Uh, the, the Bolsheviks, of course, uh, <clears throat> had a, a rocky relations with countries in the West, the United States, Britain, France, and even Japan, uh, as they had sent troops in to occupy portions of Russia uh, after the, the revolution. And the sting of that intervention uh, remained with them and literally colored uh, their relations with the West, uh, Western uh, industrial democracies for some time. And so it was not surprising when when Gormley was escorting uh, relief ships uh, to Odessa uh, that he would get, uh, uh, I would say, suspicion and and uh, paranoia on the part of some of the Bolsheviks down there. It was in uniform. Not all the Bolsheviks were concerned, but certainly uh, they were they were very were very bothered by the fact that okay, here we go. Uh, you were supporting the the white Russian counter revolutionaries. And now suddenly we're having issues here and you guys are coming back again. And so naturally there would be this, this type of uh, feeling uh, on the part of the Bolsheviks. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, uh, Elliot, uh, why don't you tell us about the mission to Odessa that Gormley uh, carries out in the midst of all these uh, activities? Well, I, th I think a word has to be said for, uh, for Maxim Gorky. It was uh, Gorky who appealed to Herbert Hoover to uh, uh, convince the American government to uh, provide relief to the starving Ukrainians and Russians uh, during the big famine of 1922. And uh, so Gormley uh, got the assignment to, to take a relief ship to Odessa and uh, when he got there, as as Bob said, the local Bolsheviks were uh, were, were extremely hostile and would not let him unload his his relief effort. So the Gormley's crew took matters into their own hands and started uh, providing food out of their own uh, their own supplies, which enraged the Bolsheviks even more. So they were they had to stop that mission and proceed eastward to uh, Novorossik. Yeah, that's just so, I mean, that just speaks so well of the sailors that they uh, supplied them out of their own supplies. Yeah. Uh, and it's important to note that while there's some friction on the top levels of this, uh, on, the, on the more enlisted level, there's a great photo in there where it shows a U.S. sailor and a Bolshevik uh, Red Army soldier like smoking a cigarette on the docks together, just two young guys uh, kind of crossing paths and uh, hands across the water, so to speak. Um, so it's kind of neat to see that on that level, on the human level, there's plenty of good connection going on. Yeah. What about the um, Greek Civil War? Uh, not the Greek Civil War, I'm sorry. The, the war between the Greeks and the Turks. Uh, he gets kind of embroiled in that a, a bit too. Let's Maybe, Robert, can you tell us about that? Well, this was, a, uh, I guess, a, a natural outgrowth of bad relations between the Greeks and the Turks. Because uh, you have to go back further another hundred years with the Greek in the, uh, fight for Greek independence from the Ottoman Empire, which succeeded. Uh, if you remember, of course, Lord Byron got involved and so on. It, it had become a cause celebre in, in Europe at the time. So there was a lot of, uh, especially with the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, 
there was a lot of scurrying for positions in in uh, parts of the empire which had large non-Turkish uh, populations like uh, up in uh, northern Turkey and down in the south too, including uh, down by uh, Lebanon and so on and Syria with uh, large Arab populations. So naturally, uh, <laughs> when when uh, aid was being brought into the Turks to a Greek controlled region, it was not it was not viewed uh, very sympathetically, as the Greeks and the Turks were maneuvering for control of, of certain uh, geographic positions that they had they laid claim to. Uh, it was a situation that would take some years to to clear up, and even to this day, we still have issues in the Aegean uh, over certain islands uh, claimed by both the Turks and the Greeks. Things change or they stay the same. Yes. Now, you, you, you all point out how he had a very kind of uh, frosty relationship with his um, superior officer, uh, Rear Admiral Bristol. Um, maybe, uh, Elliot, tell us about that relationship that uh, Gormley had with uh, Rear Admiral Bristol. Well, it was, it was uh, kind of a, almost a father-son relationship for a while. Uh, Bristol had his wife there to make his life easier, and uh, Gormley had his wife, so they became kind of a foursome. Uh, Bristol took the, took the dinner, but but Bristol was one tough hombre. He was uh, uh, a ramrod straight by the book commander who, who, would, who would not let personal sentimentality uh, uh, influence his attitude toward a subordinate. So when he inspected Gormley's ship, the Sands, he found that equipment hadn't been properly secured. And he gave uh, Gormley a low rating and a warning that uh, he was going to look at it again after Gormley's trip around the Black Sea to Odessa and Novorossi. So basically, uh, Gormley was under a, a cloud during this entire mission. We had this warning from uh, uh, Bristol that if he didn't shave up, if he, he could get another negative rating that could uh, hurt his career. So there was unusual pressure on Gormley during this entire time. Um, yeah, yes, there indeed was. And uh, he comes off in the way he handles a lot of this situation, especially the um, the blow up between the Greeks and the Turks is a decisive, quick thinking, um, all these things. Yet for all that, uh, Gormley will have sort of a, uh, I guess you could say a rocky career. Um, why don't you tell us about his subsequent uh, career going forward, Robert, um, from here until um, his sort of, uh, I guess you could almost call it ignominious um, finale in World War II. Uh, why don't you kind of fill us in on his uh, what what proceeds for him after this? And I've got a question to follow up with that with you, Elliot. I think you're looking at a uh, officer who uh, had exhibited uh, certain characteristics, especially in the area of uh, staff relations and personal relations, which uh, kind of colored his career as he would go from, from staff position to uh, what you would call an operational position. But he really only had one command at sea, one, one battleship. And but he he kind of followed a track towards a staff officer or a staff type type officer uh, going to the war college and then, you know, getting involved as the assistant uh, chief of naval operations and so on, the vice chief of naval operations. Uh, and so he he had he kind of got away from that operational control and his ability in, in being a staff officer, especially when he went to. Uh, England is the special naval off observer. Uh, his reports, I found his reports uh, detailed and fascinating and, and insightful uh, on all issues, including strategy and operations and even technology. Uh, he had a lot to say about the limitations of radar and so on uh, and in the fighting in the, in the Atlantic before the United States got involved. Uh, but when he, I don't think this all gave him the sense of how to run a large operation without having to put his hands in everything. And that was a, a drawback when he uh, became the uh, commander in chief of the uh, South Pacific theater was that he approached, I think he approached the situation as a staff officer uh, 
rather than as a commander uh, and because he couldn't seem to delegate uh, responsibility or delegate activity and then trust that his subordinates would carry it out, that he would get in, instead he would get involved in a minutia of logistics and administration and so on instead of leaving it to his staff. And so he, he, he kind of lost control of what was going on. I think the, the most relevant uh, incident uh, in the South Pacific is when he failed to show up at a meeting of all his subordinates and uh, uh, decisions were made, uh, which he was only informed about and he agreed to, but probably uh, shouldn't have, in, uh, especially letting Fletcher take his carriers out of the uh, area of Guadalcanal, you know, 48 hours after the invasion. So I, I, I think he, he had followed mainly a, a uh, professional career as, as mostly as a staff officer and, and so on, but he, he never really got that operational experience and sense of how to control you know, a multifaceted operation uh, after he departed from the Black Sea, which really, in essence, was really uh, his, his ship and, and relationships on shore, but he didn't really command a large task force or anything. So I think that sort of inhibited his his development as an operations officer, which sort of left him not really suitable as being commander of the South Pacific Theater. Does that long rambling answer help? <laughs> Absolutely. It's actually quite interesting. I was just recently in a previous podcast talking to Trent Hone about uh, what made Admiral Nimitz so successful. And one of the key ingredients of his formula for success was the ability to drive decision making down to trust his subordinates that are there in the situation to make the decision without delegating every single thing. So that's kind of an interesting uh, case study in contrasting leadership styles and one that works and one that kind of doesn't. Um, Elliot, for all that though, would you say that um, if his career had gone in different, you know, different directions, a little more catered toward his abilities, uh, based on what we see about uh, how uh, deftly he handles the complex situation in the Black Sea in the 20s, that perhaps Gormley is um, underrated by history. Um, would you make a case in defense of Gormley if you can or if you wish to? I think he's certainly due for re-examination. What, what gets lost in the story of Gormley is his, his finest hour was easily his his period in London as a special naval observer on assignment from Roosevelt. And uh, it was in this role that he excelled as a, a kind of a behind the scenes uh, problem solver, uh, working out American relations with, with Britain in, in naval policy. And, he, and he, uh, he did that for about 18 months which led toward the uh, the ABC agreements in early '41, <laughs> and uh, I think he was key in in solidifying American British naval understanding of, of what the American and British roles would be. For example, he was uh, a pioneer in developing the idea of planned dog, which was the idea of the United States would go to war against Europe first and Japan second if America got into the war. So he, he but in this role in as a London observer, he was the exact opposite of Halsey. He, Halsey was a flamboyant, outspoken, colorful, uh, uh, almost profane commander who people the his his crews loved him. Uh, Gormley was a quiet, soft-spoken, very amiable uh, uh, admiral who gained respect and confidence of people but doing so quietly behind the scenes. He didn't want to be noticed, and this is where he excelled. So if, if, if Stark hadn't replaced him in London in uh, 1941, uh, Gormley would have had a very distinguished career as head of U.S. naval forces in Europe, but that didn't that didn't come about. Yes, um, that's a that's kind of a, a sad thing, but it's also a, something that kind of gives him his due. Um, if his career track had stayed on the direction it was going, 
he certainly had something to contribute to the effort and to the Navy. So it's kind of nice to see his uh, reputation at least a little bit uh, resuscitated. And um, Can I add a point here? There's yes. On the perception of Gormley, I hate to pull into another area, but there was a movie that came out, uh, I believe, in the 60s or 70s, in harm's way. And the character, uh, Gormley character in that, played by Dana Andrews, is shown as kind of a dilettante playing uh, uh, croquet out on the front uh, front lawn of the headquarters and so on. And that really was unfair. In reality, Gormley was intensely involved in what was going on. I think he was just overmatched uh, uh, by the command structure and so on, especially uh, handling intelligence, which was uh, uh, kind of a mess in the South Pacific at the time. Although a great deal was coming in, it wasn't being organized very well, at least it's what I can determine by the staff. And this may have influenced uh, uh, Gormley's reactions to uh, certain events, uh, not being able to filter or understand or, or give coherence to the intelligence that they were that they were giving but to get back to the initial point that i was making was that the the portrayal of the gormley character in the film makes it sound like he was uh, just not interested in running the command uh which in fact it was completely opposite he was intensely involved but in the wrong way uh trying to micromanage and micro handle uh uh situations in various areas like uh, logistics especially where his staff really should have been doing it. He should not have been so intimately involved. So you heard it here. I had a, had a footnote. Please do, yes. There is another movie that's uh, equally interesting on the gormley Halsey relationship, and this movie called The Gallant Hours, and it begins with Halsey, played by James Cagney, uh, flying into uh, New Caledonia to uh, relieve Gormley. And Gormley is totally flummoxed and flustered about why he's being relieved. And he, and Gormley rather plaintively asks the uh, the uh, Palsy character played by Cagney, why was I relieved? What did I do wrong? And the Halsey character replies, you did nothing wrong, but I will get credit for everything you did right. Well, of course, that overstates it. Uh, Gormley did do things wrong, as uh, uh, Bob Hanyak just pointed out. One of his major failures was not going to Guadalcanal in person and see what was going on personally. But he did, he did make mistakes. As, as Bob pointed out. But nevertheless, the, uh, the, the Cagney or Halsey comment does suggest that Halsey got credit for some things that, that Gormley got right. <laughs> so there you have it, folks. You heard it here first for the record that uh, Dana Andrews playing croquet on the lawn is not a fair representation <laughs> of World War II. But I have to say that Cagney in the gallant hours, uh, I mean, he was uh, – Taylor made to play Halsey, was he not? Um, I'd be curious who played um, Gormley in that scene in the Gallon Hour, so we'll look it up after this. Well, folks, this is fascinating. I mean, this is a guy that he just he seems like a footnote to Pacific War history, but there's this rich backstory to him that is uh, just so uh, colorful and gives a much more vivid, uh, fully fleshed impression of him and his capabilities. So I thank you all for um, presenting this to the readership. And I know it's going to be quite interesting for them. In addition to what it shows us new about Gormley, the commander, it also shows us an interesting um, flashback to a period that was is war torn 100 years ago as it is today, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing always when the past repeats itself. Thank you for joining me, folks. Uh, and uh, we look forward to having you here again uh, sometime very soon. I uh, hope to have you in the magazine again soon as well. Okay. Take care, you all, and thanks again. Thanks a lot. It was our pleasure. Well, that's it for us for today, folks. Uh, thanks for joining us for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, and uh, this is a very interesting one. I recommend you read the article as well to get the fuller story. It's action-packed, and it takes place in a geopolitical hotspot uh, in the current climate. So until the next time, fair winds and following seas. Take care. Bye-bye.